OK. All right, so um, yesterday we uh, introduced the basic ideas of, uh, of the theory of general relativity, and we introduced some mathematical structure that we claim was going to be needed to, to talk about this, uh, this theory. And in particular, we introduced this object that I claim was very phys important physically, which is the metric, uh, uh, the metric tensor. And I define space-time as being given by a differential manifold with, or differentiable manifold with a metric tensor defined, smooth metric tensor defined on it. Uh, we saw that this uh, metric tensor uh, was useful in, for instance, computing uh, sizes of, of vectors and, of course, indicating whether these vectors are time-like or, or space-like, and that with that we could define the length of curves. If these curves were time-like, they would measure the proper time along the curve. If they were space-like, they would really define a length. I should have mentioned that the given that this object is supposed to be given as a unique object in principle in a, in a, in a, in a, at least in a classical space-time, uh, it's an object that can be used to uh, define all sorts of mappings that are very interesting. For instance, I can convert a vector or a vector field into a dual vector simply by multiplying it by, by by multiplying the vector by the metric, constructing this object that now is a different type of tensor, but using the contraction to reduce it by, by one, and then obtaining an object that is a dual vector, which I usually give the same letter name just to indicate that it was obtained from the previous one. So the metric allows me to map vectors to dual vectors and vice versa, sorry vectors and dual vectors. Uh, I will introduce then uh, the inverse metric, which is going to allow me to do the opposite uh, type of thing. And, uh, and that is going to come, become very useful. Sorry? This is B sub A. This is B sub A, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, sure. Sure. As Sorry? Uh, no, no. This quantity, I mean, if I multiply, this is multilinear. So if I take a vector, if I have a vector v and I multiply it by a constant a, right? This is a vector field. This is a new vector field, right? If I, in particular, if I'm computing at a point, I have rescaled the vector. The, met, the, the size will rescale by a square. So it could give any, you know, it could give any numbers. Yeah. If it's positive, if it's positive, it's space-like, right. The sign will tell me if it's positive. That, that's what I mean, right? Yeah. So with that, I said we could, you know, describe the length of curves. It was for time-like curves, it was very useful to parameterize the curves by the proper time. And using that, I can define the four velocity of a, of, of a particle if it's following a word line. And I also could describe the word line, the four velocity of an observer for the particle if it has mass A, mass M, then I could define the energy momentum, the, yeah, the, 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 the energy momentum uh, vector for vector that characterizes the particle. And given a particle word line and an observer that crosses that word line at some point, I could define what is the energy that this observer assigns to this particle in this, in this way, right? So I said that this, this takes us along into, this already starts uh, providing physical meaning to the, to, the, to the theory, but of course this is, uh, is still far from what we need. The next thing that we need to, to talk about is to be able to describe dynamics 
uh, of things, in particular how simple things as particles move in this space-time and things of that sort. And for that, we will need something that allows us to compare vectors at different vector fields at the, uh, or vectors at different points. And for that, we will use something that we call a derivative operator, which is an object that assigns to a tensor, to a tensor field of type Nm, a new tensor field of type Nm plus one. So it's going to be an object that, for instance, given, given a, vector, a vector field BV is going to assign Construct, allow me to construct this new object, which is a new tensor field of one index higher in the, in the, in the low dimension, okay? Um, I wanted to operate as a, 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 as a derivative operator, so I, the <coughs> that is imposed by requiring it to satisfy certain loose roles, uh, uh, rules, so it will, it will be, a linear object, so it acting on the sum of two objects is, is, is this as a sum. It will satisfy Leibniz's rule, which means that acting, le now let me forget about putting all the indices, acting on some object AB is going to give me first A times the object acting on B plus, that's Leibniz's rule. Uh, I want it to, to uh, commute with the contraction operator and use and acts on functions in uh, it acts on functions in a manner that is compatible with the notion of a, uh, of a differential of a function in the sense that it that when this object is acting on f what it gives me is the thing that i called df previously right which i said was a dual vector and it's a dual vector in the sense that it when 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 acting on a vector field, it gives me the vector acting by this. I mean that V A acting on grad A F is V on F. Which was the directional derivative of f in the direction d, okay? So those are the rules that I want this differential uh, operator to, to satisfy. And it's easy to see that associated with the coordinate chart, I can construct a derivative oper operator called, as the, called the ordinary derivative operator associated with the chart, with the chart, which is defined in the following way. I take the expression of the tensor field and write it in the term, in, in expanded in the, in the coordinate basis associated with the chart. In other words, I write the tensor field in this form, and then take the ordinary derivative of this object with respect to the coordinate x, and add an extra d rho c to the quantity. Okay, so this is the rule of how to construct this, this new uh, object. This object. But the point is that I constructed this associated with a chart. I can construct this object associated with any other chart. And I construct and construct, in fact, an infinite collection of derivative operators. There is an unbound number of, of operators that satisfy all these properties. This is one of them. In particular, we should keep in mind that the derivative operators associated with different charts are different types of objects. They are not the same objects written in different coordinates. There is no reason why this object acting on a tensor expressed in one coordinate should relate in a simple way to the expression of this derivative operator in the coordinates, appropriate coordinates acting on the same tensor. So there is for the moment, absolutely no relation between how these two objects act on the same tensor. These are two different derivative operators acting on the same uh, object, okay? That, that's the point. However, there is a very interesting and very useful result 
that can be proven, given the conditions that I said initially, the difference between any two derivative operators is completely described by a tensor. Given two derivative operators, there is a tensor that characterizes completely what is the derivative, uh, what is the difference between the two derivative operators. In other words, what I'm saying, uh, is that if I am given the object, this derivative operator and another derivative operator, then the difference between the two acting on a, on a tense, on a vector field, for instance, this object <coughs> minus this object is always given by a tensor. Multiply by this, okay? There is always such a tensor that connects two derivative operators. So that constrains the arbitrariness that exists in the choice of a derivative operator to the, or the collection of possible uh, tensors of this, uh, of this type. Yes? Here I'm summing, yeah, sorry. I, I'm going to continue making these mistakes in the blackboard, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Using the, the notion of derivative operator, I can define the notion of transporting a vector parallel to a curve. This is a notion. Let me not get into the details. There is a notion I can, I can uh, define. <coughs> well, let me define it since I'm. So I have a curve. I have a ten. The curve is parameterized by a vector, by a parameter lambda. I have the tangent the tangent to the the tangent to the to the to, to the curve and i will say that a certain vector is transported parallel to this curve if it satisfies the property that ta ta acting on vv is zero along the curve that will that will characterize the notion that I have a vector that has been transported parallel along the curve. So, parallel along the curve. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's parallel along the curve, but it's parallel in some, sen some sense to the direction defined by the curve. But okay, well. So, That's right, sorry, that's right. Yeah, it's not keeping. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Okay, but once I define this notion, I'm going now to restrict myself to a very particular type of the reality operator, which is one that happens to match the metric in the following sense, that if I transport Two, par two vectors parallel along the curve, the size of the vectors and the, and the angle between the two vectors remains constant. And remember, the size and the angles are measured using the metric. So that requires, or the, the condition for which, under which that happens, is that the derivative operator acting on the metric vanishes. When you do that, parallel transports preserve sizes and products between two vectors. Okay, so this seems like a natural thing to do, to adapt your derivative operator to the metric. It's all, this thing is, this derivative operator is known as the covariant derivative associated with the metric, and it's uniquely determined by the metric. Given any derivative, any ordinary derivative operator and the derivative operator associated with the metric, their, its difference is given by something called the Christoffel symbol, 
But it's very important to note that this object, well, this, this object is the particular version of this object that is relevant to connecting the derivative operator associated with the metric to any ordinary derivative operators of the kind that I introduced at the beginning. Okay? Well, that's the two, ob the, the two derivative operators that are being connected. This object is called the Christopher symbol. And this Christopher symbol is a tensor which is intimately associated with two things, with, of course, the metric that you have in your space-time and the particular ordinary derivative operators that you have. Te no, t red is warning. Te t red is meant to be, you know, a point where, o where confusion often arises. So here the red is for you to note that this object is a tensor. It's sometimes in other presentations is, people say it's not a tensor. I don't know what it is. Here it is clear that it's a tensor. But it's very important for, to avoid confusion that it's not... It, 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 it's intimately connected with these two objects. So the tensor that connects the derivative operator associated with the metric to the ordinary derivative operator associated with another chart is a different tensor. It's not the same tensor written in another coordinate. Yep. Here. Yeah, you're right. A and B should be A. Yeah, it's the opposite. Yep, you're right. Sorry. It transforms as a tensor. As it transforms as a tensor, but you have to make sure that you are talking about the same. It, it, it transforms as a tensor. It don't, it, forget about it, it transforms. It is a tensor. Its coordinates will, if you write it in coordinates, it will transform as a tensor. It's, however, not the same as the tensor associated with the metric and the coordinate y y written in the, co in the coordinate y, right? It's a different object. They need not be related or, or simply related. The thing that is normally said to interfere with this transformation law is precisely the fact that you're talking about comparing this derivative operator with this derivative operator and this derivative operator with another derivative operator, okay? Of course, the relation between those is going to be given by the relation between those because the derivative operator, this derivative operator and the, and the derivative operator, ordinary derivative operator associated with the coordinate chart y is also described by an object of this sort. Okay? So you're going to be able to find what's the relationship between those things. Okay? Now, Given a, given a chart and given the derivative operator associated with the chart, one can compute by the requirement that the, that the, this requirement that we put on the, on the, on the metric, by the requirement that the, this derivative operator annihilates the metric or acting on the metric vanishes, we will be, one is able to compute precisely the expression for this object in that associated with that coordinate uh, set. So this object has this expression where these are the, the, the ordinary derivative operators acting on the metric, which of course need not vanish. Okay, this is a calculation, it's a straightforward calculation that comes from the requirement that I said. Okay? The identity operator, <coughs> oh sorry, ah, here I introduced some object that I hadn't introduced before. This object, sorry, I, I wrote a vector, an object that I mentioned before but I didn't said what it was, is the inverse metric tensor. It's a tensor, it's a metric tensor of type 2,0 that satisfies this property that contracted with the ordinary metric, it gives me the identity operator. And the identity, the identity tensor better be a tensor that has one index up and one index down because acting on something that has one index up, it should give me back something that has one index up. Right? Okay, in other words, I want, this is the identity 
I can use now the metric and the inverse metric to raise and lower indices at, you know, at will and, con and change the character of tensors, uh, maintaining the total number of indices fixed. And once I have this object, this derivative operator, I will postulate, or we take as a postulate, that free particles follow the geodesics of space-time metric, and the geodesics can be characterized by the fact that these are word lines for which the tangent vector is parallel transported, which is this requirement. Actually, by changing the parameterization of the, of the curve, one can change that equation into opa. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Okay, so I can. The normal statement is to say that the, that a geodesic is a curve such that the, that the tangent vector is parallel transport up to a size, a rescaling of the size, but but it turns out that one can always reparameterize the curve to ensure that that the, the new after the, the, the new the new curve in the new parameterization of the curve you have this equation which is called the geodesic equation. Uh, this is one way to characterize the, the, the these curves. Another way is to say they extremize the proper time or the proper distance between two points. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that the prop that if I have a, a, a geodesic associated with a, uh, which is a time-like geodesic, and I parameterize the geodesic with proper time, that proper time is automatically an affine parameter, and then my geodesic take, equation takes this form. So the world lines of free massive particles are supposed to be time-like geodesics. The, ge the world lines of massless particles, photons for instance, should correspond to null geodesics. And that already contains a lot of information about how particles behave in, in a space-time. Yes? No, if I, if I know that the particle is free, that there are no other forces on acting on the particle, right? Yeah. If, if in an inertial frame, if in a local inertial frame, these particles would have been, uh, been moving inertially, in the glo at global scale, they are moving along the geodesics of this. And this is something that can actually be directly realized in the, in, in the space-time. In, 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 in this formalism, sorry, because as I was going to say, the, the basic idea of the equivalent, equivalence principle is realized mathematically by something called, some construction called norm, normal Riemann coordinates, which basically says that given any point on the manifold, you can construct, there is a procedure, algorithmic procedure by which you can construct coordinates such that the components of the metric will have the form, you know, basically the, the, the Minkowski form of the metric, and there will be corrections that, that are proportional to the, you know, separation, the coordinate separation squared of the, uh, of the uh, point. In particular, since these things grow like y squared and not like y, it will ensure that in that coordinate set, using those coordinates, the, um, the Christopher symbols will vanish because if you, if you see, they have single derivatives of the metric. And therefore, the geodesic equation will correspond to simply saying that in those coordinates, the components of the four velocity remain constant, which is to say they are moving in a straight line according to you know, the description in those coordinates. So that's the realization of the principle of equivalence in this 
setting. Okay? That already contains a lot of information, not complete, but a lot of information, because you happen to know that if you happen to know how something behaves uh, in a Minkowski spacetime, and its behavior can be described in terms of you know, sufficiently low derivative regimes, you automatically know how it behaves in a curved spacetime. In other words, go to, go to these coordinates, construct these coordinates, right, at any given point, and then see how required that these objects move in that locally Minkowski spacetime in the ordinary way, and that already tells you how this, write it now the thing back in, the or, in, the, in, in your arbitrary coordinates, and this already is telling you how things behave generically, okay? So for instance, you could write Maxwell's equations directly. This recipe will tell you what Maxwell's equations look like in a curve, fixed curve spacetime. <clears throat> and the recipe, generically, the recipe is change derivatives by covariant derivatives. It's not a completely determined uh, expression if, you know, sometimes there are arbitrariness in, in these things that have to do with the presence of higher derivatives in part of the metric, in particular curvature, which is something we will encounter in a moment. Okay? I don't see enough, it's okay. I see a lot of, please stop me if you, Say yes or say, or, or ask something. Yes. Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so we said initially that, curve, that, that gravity resided in the fact that these inertial frames cannot be extended arbitrarily, that they are local, right? And this is presented here by the fact that the best I can do is to ensure that this, you know, that the metric is Minkowski up to corrections that go like y squared, but if I try to go beyond that, there are obstructions, and those obstructions are characterized by curvature. In fact, okay, so let me say first what is curvature and then say what is the fact about curvature. So the Riemann curvature tensor is defined by successive application of two derivative operators on smooth uh, uh, dual vector fields. So let W be a, a, a vector field let me compute the derivative operator and then another derivative act on it with another, the same derivative operator but with, a, with another index. So I now have produced a tensor of, of order of, of type 0, 3. Produce this tensor in the, in the order, order, in the different order, and subtract these two quantities. You obtain a quantity called, it turns out that when you do that, you can show that the that this object is, can be represented by a tensor that contracted with the, with the, with the dual tensor you wanted, okay? This is not a very long proof, but in the same way that one can prove, in essentially the same way that one can prove that the difference between two derivative operators is, is given by a tensor, one can prove, it's not, it's not tautological, but, but one can prove it, uh, that the difference between two, you know, two different orders of application of, a, of, of, of uh, derivative operators is characterized by a tensor, again, contracted with the object that you want. So this object, def this equation defines for you this very, very important tensor cur called the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, it can be expressed in terms of the Christopher symbol, so you can just substitute what each, these derivative operators uh, do. Well, I, I should I should have, have said how derivative operators act on more complicated tensors. How I told you I told you how the derivative operator di how two different what's the difference between two dif derivative operators acting on a vector from here. From, from this kind of uh, rules, one can deduce how it acts on objects, bigger, bigger objects, simply because we know that we can construct bigger objects 
con multiplying you know, tensors of higher order, mo doing multiplication by tensors of lower order. So, in any way, doing that, cal that calculation, one can show that the expression for the uh, Riemann curvature, uh, Riemann curvature in terms of the Christopher symbols is given by this. And of course, I'm talking about always, these are ordinary derivative operators. These are the things that connect, the Christopher symbols that connect the specific derivative, these same uh, derivative operators with the, with the derivative operator associated with the metric. And <coughs> although this expression seems to be very dependent on which particular ordinary derivative operator happens to, to you, you happen to be using, the fact that the object has been defined without reliance on any coordinates frame, because this object, these derivative operators were associate, defined by the, the way they act on the metric, so the metric completely defined this object, indicates that this object is a tensor and is independent of the coordinate. Yes. Okay, this object tends to characterize various very important features. It tells you, for instance, the relative acceleration of nearby geodesics. It tells you about the non-commutativity of uh, parallel transport along geodesics. So I take a vector, transport it along the geodesic here, take a vector, transport it about, uh, along a geodesic here, parallel transport it along a geodesic here, parallel transport it back. The difference at first order, at lowest order between these two vectors is given by this uh, curvature tensor, and more importantly, at the conceptual level, it can be shown that the non-vanishing of the curvature tensor represents the unique obstruction to extending the Minkowski coordinates or, or this normal Riemann coordinates to a larger set. If, in other words, if the Riemann tensor is zero, if it vanishes, you can construct, vanishes in a set, a convex set, you can extend the, the coordinate, the, the normal coordinates so that they are, so that this equation is satisfied without any corrections on the whole convex set that you, you're interested in. Okay, so this is, this is it. That's what represents curvature. That represents the fact that you cannot construct local inertial frames. Okay, so with that at hand, the very important step that Einstein did in constructing the theory is propose a reasonable equation that will reproduce Newtonian gravity uh, and that will be self-consistent and, 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 and therefore would correspond as a candidate equation for the way the metric should behave in general relativity. And ba the basic idea of, of the analysis is to see that while this curvature tensor represents, reflects a relative acceleration between, between free falling, uh, uh, between geodesics, between nearby geodesics, in Newtonian mechanics we have something similar which is called tidal forces which tells us what is the relative acceleration between two free particles that are undergoing free fall under gravity. And we know that these tidal forces, I mean the force in Newtonian gravity is just the derivative of the Newtonian potential. The tidal force is the difference between, between that force in different points. So it's going to be related to the derivative of the Newtonian, the second derivative of the Newtonian potential, right? times the separation, of course, of the particle. Considering exactly the same type of situation, but now in the previous language, you see that somehow the second derivatives of the Newtonian potential should correspond to what is encoded in the Riemannian tensor. And we happen to know something, how the second derivatives of the Newtonian potential relate to matter, how matter affects gravity. This is Poisson equation. So in the same way, we should have curvature, something associated with cur curvature, related to 
some description, appropriate description of matter. In this case, the, the appropriate covariant, uh, uh, you know, naturally covariant description of, of uh, matter is characterized by the energy momentum tensor, which encodes, well, densities, but as well, I mean, in other words, density can be identified as the zero, zero component, density in general relativity, in special relativity, could be identified, if you want, as the zero, zero component of the energy momentum tensor. And then it's natural that the equation, Einstein, the, the equation that connects curvature to matter would involve this energy momentum tensor. So you needed some equation. And consistency of the equation, the consistency of the equation, basically the consistency is the requirement that this object should be linear in the, in the Riemannian curvature. And as well as this object, it should have a zero derivative, zero covariant derivative, because in, Newton, in uh, special relativity, the energy momentum tensor is characterized by the fact that its covariant derivative is zero. Basically, gives you this unique construction as the equation for general relativity. These objects, by the way, are constructed from the Ricci, from the, uh, uh, from the Riemann curvature by uh, contraction. You, you, this object that has two indices is the con contraction of these two indices of the Riemann tensor. The, Riemann, the, the Ricci scalar is the further contraction with the inverse metric. And this object on this side has the property that if you, ap at, you apply to this the derivative associated with the metric, this, this side has automatically zero divergence which is a nice generalization for the requirement. I mean, it's compatible with the natural requirement that in general relativity, this object should have, again, zero divergence, which would correspond, again, in the local, in, in, in the local inertial frame realized by normal coordinates to the standard requirement about the energy momentum tensor in special relativity. OK, uh, here, sometimes this, is, this term is not introduced. Uh, in fact, Einstein didn't introduce it at the, at the beginning. This extra term is called the cosmological constant. It is, is, is clearly a, a possibility. Uh, so you could consider Einstein's equations with or without the cosmological constant, depending on or, or, or what, what, what you're interested in, in considering. Um, and that's it. This, this equation constrains the geometry of space-time by the presence of matter in space-time. However, one should be very careful. This equation does not determine the metric of space-time given the matter that is present in space-time. Right? It's, it's only a constrained equation. To completely determine the metric even if you have given me the energy momentum tensor, is equivalent to completely determine the electric magnetic field, even if you give me the charges. You have to give me something more. You have to give me initial conditions. So this equation, together with initial condition, does determine the metric of space-time. But it's a big mistake to, to assume that you know, matter will completely determine, will completely determine the metric of space-time. We will see later, for instance, that there are black hole solutions in space-times that contain absolutely no matter, in which this object is zero, and nevertheless, you have something dramatic like a black hole. You have other things that are very dramatic that ha we have seen recently, which are gravity waves. Those gravity waves are very interesting, non-trivial solutions of Einstein's equations, in which, in the region of interest, there is no matter whatsoever. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. We we will actually meet that question precisely in 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 my next thing when I tell you about initial formulation. But basically, you know, the projection of the of the four metric of space time on a given hypersurface and something equivalent to its you know instantaneous time derivative is going to be what is needed. So we now have uh, the description of how matter affects geometry, we already had before how the description of how geometry affects matter, individual 
point-like particles are supposed to, if they are free, of course, are supposed to follow the geodesics. If not, if they are not free, they are going to, of course, be affected by, by the respective forces. Fields, electromagnetic fields, will satisfy equations, cor cor the, the versions of Maxwell's equations in which, you know, covariant derivatives replace the ordinary derivatives simply because in the normal Riemann coordinates, I have the situation reduced to the situation that, that holds in a, a, an inertial frame. Yes? So, uh, I'm completing what you said about the, the initial condition. So, why was cosmological constant required instead of matching initial conditions to the case of uh, Big Bang or space generation? Well, what Einstein, what, what, what Einstein found it, it was that it was very difficult to construct in, uh, uh, initial conditions that, that given a matter distribution will stay static if yeah. you didn't put any, if you don't put anything. Because so. Because of all of these mathematics you, you presented is very elegant. So somehow to impose this. Well, this is also elegant. It doesn't take any elegance away. Uh, well, why, why? <laughs> I mean, this other term here, I don't know. Yeah. Stable static solutions. Okay. Yep. But now it may be that it's not a mistake after all. Today we have this dark energy whose mo most simple explanation or representation is a cosmological constant. So it maybe wasn't a blunder after all. Uh, anyway, uh, let me not give you the exercises. Oh, but this exercise has something very important. Well, let me now say something about use of ordinary concepts. Many concepts that we are used to, 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 to rely on in physical discussions simply disappear in, in general relativity. One concept, for instance, is the energy of a particle. I told you that an observer can assign an energy to the particle. That would be his interpretation of what is the energy of the particle. And of course, a different observer that is passing through the same point with a different forward velocity will assign a different value of an energy. However, when this observer again encounters the particle, even if the particle has been moving freely, he will find a completely different number. So there is no energy conservation, no notion of, you know, energy, good energy, energy conservation or momentum conservation of anything of that sort. Under some circumstances, this notion can be recovered. A vector field that basically represents a Displacement of the, you can imagine taking a vector field and, dis and, 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 and displacing the metric or the, that the, you have put in the space time along this vector field. Well, the, the precise notion is called uh, one dimensional group of diffeomorphisms. Okay, let me not get into that. But basically, you can imagine a vector field telling you how to move tensors and displace them. And in particular, the metric may be displaced under this uh, operation. And you then can compare the displaced metric and the non-displaced metric, the modified metric and the non-modified metric. If the metric, the modified metric, turns out to be the exactly the same metric as the one previous modified, you say the metric has a symmetry. Actually, an iso it's called an isometry. And when you have an isometry, the vector field that produces this displacement is called a ve killing field. A killing field has that the property, it's a field that satisfies this equation, where, of course, this operator is where the relationship with the metric is encoded. <clears throat> uh, 
one example of an existence of such vector field occurs when, for instance, uh, you have a space-time represented in some coordinates in which the, the coefficient, in, in which the, the components of the metric written in those coordinates happen not to, def to depend on the coordinate. Then, in that case, this object is readily shown to be a killing field of the metric. In fact, in general, you, given a killing field, in a, at least some region, you can construct a, a coordinates that are adapted to the killing field and in which this will happen. When you have that, and this I leave you for an exercise, this is a good, very quick exercise, and, and one can prove that in that instance, in that instance, if you have a particle that is moving along a geodesic with a tangent vector TA, then the quantity, this quantity, the tangent to the geodesic, when of course the geodesic is parametrized in an affine manner, contracted with the, uh, sorry, multiplied with, with, with tensor field with the killing field and contracted with the metric in this way, produce a constant along the curve, right? When the, vec when the killing field is time-like, we call that constant energy. In that case, you have a conservation of energy for particles moving along. <clears throat> you can have other conservation laws. Sim Are these conservation laws that I mentioned? Sorry? I need the equation, well, what I'm saying is you compute this quantity for the particle at one point on, the, on its curve, and I now assume that the particle is moving a, along a geodesic. I compute this corresponding quantity for the particle in another point, and this value is the same. Of course, this requires the particle to move along the geodesic. If the particle moves in a different way, this quantity is not conserved. All right. Similarly, similarly, generically, you will not be able, one is not able to define the energy content of the space-time. In cosmology in particular, there is no such a thing as a conserved energy. There is no energy. You cannot define a reasonable definition of energy. You can invent something that you may want to call an energy, but doesn't have any of the good properties that you want. It will, for instance, depend on which hypersurface you compute it or something of, of that sort. We, we, we will get back to that situation. The existence of killing fields is, in, the, in, in general relativity, the requirement to have in general conservation. Um, another interesting thing that should be said about, about Einstein equations is that it can be the, they can be derived from an... Uh, variational principle, uh, let me not get into this detail, but okay, basically you write, you write the curvature, the, this curvature scalar that we introduced previously, integrate over uh, the space-time the, 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 the space coordinates multiplied by this object, which is the determinant of the metric that, that ensures that, that you have a, you know, reasonable, well-defined integration notion uh, that is independent of coordinates in some sense. And when, when one, one does uh, that and at the same time takes matter and describes it in a similar way, so you have here the Lagrangian of matter and do a similar thing for, to describing the, the action, then variation of the total action with respect to the space-time metric produces Einstein's equations where the energy momentum tensor is simply the object that emerges from taking the variation of the matter size. So this is a very convenient thing that puts GR in similar footing with many other uh, physical theories. Uh, of course, also, this also is going to be the starting point 
for the Hamiltonian formalism to GR, which we will encounter uh, also in, 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 in the future talk. Uh, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to get there. So I have jumped over many proofs, many details, many issues, but I hope I have given you a reasonable superficial view of what the theory is, is about. Uh, hopefully with that you will, you, 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 you will be able to enjoy the discussions about black holes. All right. Thank you. So, sorry, if there are any questions, I'm, I finished saying what I need to say, but I can answer, try to answer questions. Yeah, I wanted, I didn't want to say, I didn't want to go there. Okay, this, this, this object is a completely anti-symmetric tensor, which is called the volume element. So given a, any n-dimensional manifold, there is an object that is, well, Completely anti-symmetric tensors uh, are a one-dimensional have one have, uh, are one-dimensional correspond to, to a one-dimensional vector space. So two of them differ only by by a rescaling. And if you choose the rescaling the, the scale in a way that is appropriate to the metric, that is called the volume element of the spacetime with the metric. If the space-time doesn't have a metric, there is no clear definition of what is the volume element, and you have this, you know, arbitrariness of, of scale, but not, not, not any other arbitrariness except that arbitrariness of scale. So, in the end, when you do calculations, it turns out to be this. You're welcome. Why don't you ask them? <laughs> <laughs>